this one thing remains. This one thing remains. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on.
Hello and welcome to the symposium. My name is Jamel and I will be telling you a little bit about the announcements that we have for you today. First off, symposia is a place where we want you to feel like you're at home. And there's no better way to do that than to join one of our small groups. Our small groups are a way for you to collaborate and, and have fun with people that have similar interests such as yours. One way to sign up is to go to our website, click on groups, and then find the group that best fits your needs. I look forward to seeing you there. If this is your first time here, you're not obligated to give whatsoever. But if you came prepared to give, there are multiple ways for you to do that. You can either mail us, cash, or check, or you can give online at www.symposia.church forward slash give. Or you can also text a dollar amount to 84321. Thank you for your generous donations. Good morning, Symposia. I'm just so excited to be here, and I'm so excited to be able to share God's Word with you today. And I'm just so honored and privileged that uh, my family and I, Val and I, and my two kids are able to serve here for this community and serve, uh, serve you guys here in Symposia. You know, we love you, and we miss you, and we cannot wait to go back into the building and worship with you. Um, and those, uh, those who are watching, and this is your first time watching with us, I just want to say thank you so much for taking a moment out of your day and joining us for worship. Uh, we appreciate you and we thank you so much. And those who have been engaging with us throughout the whole week with our post and with the videos that we've been, post we've been posting throughout this week, I just want to say thank you again and to the whole body of Symposia. Uh, without you, um, this Symposia um, would not exist. And I just want to say thank you so much. Um, and and, and uh, we love you and we miss you. Um, but as all of us have been experiencing during this time, we're in the middle of perhaps the most uh, difficult year uh, that we've faced in our, in our generation. We've experienced a global pandemic that, was, uh, that forced us into months and months of quarantine, and then to the horrific deaths of George Floyd, amongst others. And what we see now is people have been protesting, across the nation, people are frustrated, people are angry, and you may be feeling paralyzed, or maybe even feeling numb to all of what's going on 
um, in our world, in our country alone. And there's this need for us to have this conversation in our nation, in our society about social injustices and racism. And there's so much change that needs to happen in this country. And I'm, I'm convinced that a lot of us that are watching this are yearning and are longing for change to happen. You know, I'm grateful for the context of conversation that people have been having. I'm grateful for the posts that I've been seeing because I'm learning a lot. I'm grateful for those who have taken the step of taking it from conversation and actually taking action. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to, if you have your Bible or your digital Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians and we're going to go to chapter 12. And we're going to start with verse 12. And today what I wanted to talk about is the whole body of Christ. And the title of my talk um, is simply, If One Suffers, We All Suffer. And I just felt the need to continue this conversation around the subject of racism and, and injustice that we continue to have this conversation around this issue because this is a problem that we must confront. This is a problem that we have to change our mind about and change our perspective about. And this is a problem as a church we have to address. And I want to say that the church should be leading the way in addressing the problem of racism and injustice. And as a body of Christ, as we read in our passage today, if one suffers, all should feel the pain and the cries and the frustrations of our brothers and sisters. So if you have your Bible today, Open, open it up to 1 Corinthians, and if you don't, it's okay. We're going to have it at the below of the screen here. and We're going to start with chapter 12. Verse 12, it says, For just as the body is one as many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we're all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we're all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weak are, are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. And this is where we're going to have, this is where we're going to uh, um, concentrate uh, most of our talk on. Is if one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. You know, we, we know as human beings, we are naturally communal. But we also know on the other side of it that community is difficult. Community, having a community, a, a body of believers, just like our church plant, how challenging it can be. But you also know when the body of Christ is working in unison and is working together, it's this beautiful sight to see. It's this amazing thing that we see and we're invited into the body of Christ that's been created by God and led by the Spirit. You know, even in the early churches, there were conflicts. There were challenges. You know, in the, the, the church that Paul planted in Corinthians, they weren't immune to any challenge. There was so much conflict going on in this early church, and there was so much division, so much issues on leadership, so much issues with different parts of the body and different personalities. But Paul, when he was writing this letter to the uh, Corinthians, keeps on going back to the body of Christ because he wanted to remind them that we are part of this complete, full body of Christ. He completes this idea, if you fast forward to the end of 2 Corinthians of the letter that he wrote, he writes that we need to be of the same mind. Now, it doesn't mean that we all have to think the same, act the same. It says we have to be of the one mind of Christ. 
to practice the divine mind. Not our mortal mind, not our human mind, because our mortal mind, what happens is we, we just look out for ourselves. How does this benefit me? How am I going to survive this? What's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? But Paul, he's reminding us that the divine mind opens you up to walk and act and think like Christ. To put yourself up there on the cross and say, how do I offer myself today to the world? How do I offer myself unconditionally to follow the way of the cross? Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, then pick up your cross and follow me. You know, community is tough. And Paul knew that. Paul talks about this body of Christ. He says, listen, you need to be of one mind, but it's okay for us to be different. He says there are different parts of the body of Christ. There's different gifts that have been given to us. The arm is different from the leg, and the leg is different than the mouth, and the mouth is different than the eyes, and the eyes are different than the nose. But if the nose gets cut off, then we're all going to be hurting. So we have to be part of this full body of Christ. We're all, we're all part of this together, but the body is very different. But when the body works together, it is very harmonious. It's beautiful. It's an amazing thing. It's like the presence of heaven here on earth. But we're part of one mind in Christ. And then Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians, he says, If one part of the body suffers, then we all suffer. If one part of the body rejoices, then we all rejoice. You know, we're all called as a collectivist family of believers to feel one another's pain. You know, we don't sectionalize it or compartmentalize it and put a box around Jesus, around our own experience, and say, well, this is my own, uh, my own experience. I do feel bad for what's going on over there, but it's not my experience. I don't know. I don't know that experience, so it's not really bothering me. But Paul is saying, if I got an issue over here in my own little faction of the church that I'm planting, but I hear that my brothers and sisters over there are hurting, then I'm hurting. If my brothers, sisters, brothers and sisters are suffering over there, then I'm suffering. If your heart breaks, then my heart breaks. Paul wants us to have empathy for one another, to have compassion for one another. Paul wants us to be reminded that if our brothers and sisters' hearts are breaking, then we all break. Because unity, unity leads to understanding. Unity leads to healing. The one mind of Christ, the same mind that's in me and you, that what Jesus said in Scripture, the same mind that my Father has is in me and it's in you, the divine mind. But you know, as Christians, we sometimes don't do a good job of seeing this as a collective, collectivist family. Seeing this whole body of Christ in, in a holistic way, as a whole body of Christ. You know, denominations are great. I love denominations. I love the denomination that we're in, the Evangelical Covenant Church. You know, I get it. We all worship God in different ways. We come from different backgrounds and different cultures, from different societies. And that's why we have different denominations. But when our, under, when our denomination or when our understanding of Jesus is saying, well, you know what, that's just too bad of what's going on over there. Um, but I'm not really feeling that over here in our community um, the best that we can do is, is our thoughts and prayers go out to you, but I have my own community that I, that I need to take care of. Paul says, no, that's not how the body of Christ works, and you're putting a pin, you're essentially putting an ax to the body of Christ, and you're chopping it off, and you're separating yourself from the body of Christ where we cannot grow as a church as a whole and flourish. You know, there was a story that I came across, it was about a patient and a doctor. And this patient had a preodontal issue. And a preodontal issue is basically you have issues with your gums where flossing and brushing your teeth um, cannot solve the problem. You have to go see a preodontist. I, I think that's how you say it, a preodontist. And the preodontist has to go in there and do deep cleaning and do intense cleaning. And this patient has been really good for the last three years. This patient didn't go, hasn't had to go see a periodontist for a very long time. But the third year came up and the, the, the periodontist called this patient and says, Hey, Mr. Patient, it's about that time again. Um, it looks like we have to come back. We have, you have to come back into the office and we have to clean you up, do this intense cleaning, and we have to cut you up. And the patient was like, No, you don't have to do that. And the doctor was like, Why? Because 
The patient answered, because I don't, I don't want to come in. I'm not coming in. And he hangs up on a doctor. I'm not sure if that's true. I added that in there. Um, so the patient goes on Google and does his research, and he finds different doctors that have different ways of dealing with his issues with his gum, with his gums, and the, doc, or the patient saw this doctor and, and, and saw that um, they have unconventional ways of, of healing this issue with his gums, and they use medicine and they use leaves, so this intrigued him, and he called the doctor and he said, hey doc, I, I, I saw your website, I did my research, I saw you on Google and you had good reviews, so uh, can we have a consult, can I schedule a consult with you? And the doctor's like, yeah, sure, come on by. And so the patient comes by and he sits him down and for 45 minutes, the doctor was just asking him so many questions, asking him about his exercise habits. He was asking him about his dietary habits and he was asking him about, asking him about um, um, his, his history, his exercise habits. He went, and, he went as far as asking about his meditation practices, his prayer life, uh, his family issues. Right at that point, when he was talking about his family issues, he started getting nervous. He's like, what do you mean family issues? He's like, no, if, you had, if your family had the same condition, right? And he stops the doctor, the patient, stops the doctor and says, look, Mr. Doctor, I appreciate all the questions here. Um, first of all, you're getting a little personal. And uh, second of all, uh, you haven't even asked me once about what's going on in my gums. What's going on, uh, uh, the issue that I have over here. You're talking about all the things that are going on in my body, um, which, I, I, okay, but uh, I have an issue here. And the doctor answered, answered him and said, see, that's a problem. See, the way you look at it, it's, it's from a perspective, from a Western medicine perspective. You just see one part of your body. And the problem is you just want to put all your focus and all your energy where the issue is. And then you fail to neglect everything that's happening in your body. The problem right here is, it, is, is your gums. Yeah, you do have an issue in your gums, but the problem is, is because you're not taking care of your body, buddy. Like, first of all, you eat a lot of hot foods. Your diet needs to change. Your exercise habits need to change. You need to stop drinking alcohol. You need to stop drinking coffee. You need to stop eating things that have garlic and onion in them onions in them so for me I think you should do this for three months he was telling the patient do this for three months your body needs time to heal your body needs time to detox and come back to me after those three months and see if we made progress but let me tell you this you have to look at the body holistically you have to look at your whole body like I understand you have an issue here but you have to look at your whole body so we can deal with the issue here and I was just thinking about this for the body of Christ because we have a plague right now. And it's the plague of racism. And for far too long as a church, a lot of the times we have pointed a finger over there. And a lot of times we, have, we, know, we know the idea that racism is bad. We know that it needs to stop. That, that it's, it's, it's almost as we isolated the incident. And, uh, and, and we always have this language that we want to get back to normal. I just wanted to go, go back to normal. I just give me the medicine that just, so we can just stop talking about this racism stuff. But when we continuously say, I want to go back, I want things to go back to normal, what we're essentially saying is, is, is that we're normalizing the injustices and the racism that is happening in this world. I mean, we see it over and over again. We have so much access with our video, with our mobile phones, and we see all these horrific events that are happening that ought to break our hearts and help us realize that something's wrong. Something is rotten. Something is fundamentally broken in the body of Christ. And if one more mother cries because her son just went out for a jog and gets shot, and another brother gets killed and suffocated for eight and a half minutes or so, if another mother weeps, then we all ought to weep and we all ought to, to suffer. And we can't just say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for your loss. My thoughts and prayers are with you. No. Paul is, Paul is calling us. Jesus is calling us and we're called upon the cross to look at the holistic body of Christ and to also take responsibility and say, how am I connected to these events? 
You know, some of us have to just admit to ourselves that racism is still alive. It's still a plague in our nation and in our country. Some of us just have to admit to ourselves that, yeah, I don't know what it's like to be a black America in this country. I don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like to get pulled over and have lights flashing behind me and feeling the nervousness and the fear of my life. I don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like going into a, sh a store and being gazed at thinking that they're go I'm going to steal something. I don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like applying for a loan and hoping I won't get denied based on the color of my skin. But what I do know is I want to learn. Please tell me. I want to listen. Because as we hear in, in, in Genesis 1 that we're all made in the image of God and we're all equal and we're all formed by God. And if we're all formed by God, then I hurt with you. I suffer with you. You know, in this country, we, we built this system. The system is not broken. The system has always been this way. We built a system that says that you're less than me. It's a system that you got to deal with this. With, this is how you have to just deal with, with life. And it's very, very different for me. And we hear that what you're getting discriminated, you're getting hated on because of the color of the skin that God has given you, that ought to break us, that ought to get us angry and, 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 and break our heart. And, you know, I'll never understand what you go through because I don't go through that on an everyday basis. But the first step is I want to learn. I want to walk with you. And Paul calls me today, calls us today to be part of the body of Christ. And if you weep, I weep. And if our hearts are not breaking with our black brothers and sisters, then we have removed ourselves from the body of Christ and we made it our own. So essentially what we're doing is that we're, we're taking Jesus, my personal Savior, and just making it my own. Jesus is all mine. This is my personal Savior. But we all know that that's not how faith works. And if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, Jesus says, pick up your cross. And we all have a cross to pick up. And we have a lot of listening to do in the body of Christ. There's going to be a lot of change. There's going to be a lot of, of change that's needed in this country, a lot of reform that's needed in this country, a lot of systematic change that's needed to change this country. And we're going to need the church to be all hands on deck because our black brothers and sisters, they're sick and tired and they're frustrated of crying out against injustices and racism and feeling like they're doing this alone. We all have to suffer together, so we all make the changes together. This is how real change will happen, and it starts here in the body of Christ. It starts here in the church. You know, I found this video. It was a lady that was getting interviewed. Her name was Jackie Hill Perry, and she was a writer. She's a writer, and she's a speaker, and she describes how churches, the body of Christ, can somehow uproot the problem of racism and injustices. And she addresses, addresses the hidden feelings around the subject of, of injustice and racism. So let's watch this video together. I think one way, I think there are many ways, I think there are a lot of ways, uh, but one in particular I would think is having a community and a body that is not silent about even the different subtle racist ways or biases that people can hold. Uh, and what I mean by that is I think sometimes people can say things flippantly or uh, just make little snarky remarks, whether it's about uh, a different race or someone in a, in a different sociological position than they might be, and people just let it slide, or it's just, oh, that's just them, or that's just the culture they came from, or that, that's just how they grew up, or that, that's the things that their mothers used to say. But I, I think as a body and as a community, I think it's those little seeds that really work to harden our heart towards how we see people made in the image of God. And so I think one way that communities can work towards uprooting these kinds of things is simply calling sin, sin, and calling it out when you see it gently, lovingly discern with discernment but I think it has I think we have to talk about those little things before we even get to the big ones and so having a community that is honest having a community that is confronting having a community that is uh free to 
exhort and convict when needed and necessary, but also having an ear that is discerning to actually hear it in the conversations. And so being attentive, uh, but not in a judgmental, self-righteous way, but in a, I want black people, I want white people, I want Hispanic, I want Asian. When they come into our body, I want them to feel safe. And I want them to know that they are welcome. And I want them to know that God loves them and loves us and that he has made us all in his image and for his glory. And so, yeah, a, a community that is honest and willing to have those hard conversations and correct and confront sin when necessary. You know, we have to speak up when we see injustice and when we see racism happen, we have to say something. And as a church, I truly believe that we can make changes. We can make changes in legislation. And as a body of Christ, we can make changes to all the different institutions that have been carried forth in our DNA and in our fabric as Americans for the last 400 years. It's built within us. And I'm unaware of the racism that's ingrained in my own self. And if I don't wake up every single morning and humble myself and ask the Lord, help me, teach me, show me of how I'm a product and part of the system and, and how I've just looked at this, the injuries of my brothers and sisters that are happening over there against racism and injustice and look at my own body and say, Dad, I'm okay. Lord, help me. Lord, help me see it. Help me be conscious of it. And help me just stand for it. We have to ask the Lord to help us. So the patient that we just talked about after three months went back to the doctor. And the doctor did his regular checkup and looked at the patient and says, hey, man, you're good to go. Looks like you don't need to have, to, to have surgery. But he looks at him and says, but let me tell you this, Mr. Patient, you have to stay vigilant because you know you have an issue. You have to keep doing what you're doing, but you have to stay vigilant on everything that you're doing because you, will, you understand now that you have an issue. So for the church, this is my prayer for our church and all the churches across the country that we can't just relax because it's 2020 and try to brush it under the rug and hopefully churches will just stop People will just stop about racism. No. My prayer for the church is that we got to stay vigilant. we got to keep going. It's a long marathon. We're in a marathon right now. Let's learn to listen more, and we have to do that as a church. We need to learn and how to listen. We, we can't fully understand everything. We won't know how to articulate it well. There's going to be times where we sound dumb where we sound ignorant, but at least we are trying to listen and where at least we're trying to have conversation because it's our call as fellow brothers and sisters of the equal body of Christ to cry out and to stand with our black brothers and sisters and learn to say, how can I help in the healing of all this? So God has invited us into this moment of reconciliation, a moment to gather in unity as a church, to stand up with those who are frustrated, to stand up to those who are feeling that they are oppressed, to stand up to, to those, stand up with those who are feeling like they have no voice, to stand up with those who are just tired of crying, crying out to the injustices and the racism that is happening in this country. So let's move forward together and let's talk and have conversations. Yes, it's going to get awkward. Yes, there's going to be tension. Yes, there's going to be weird. But the Spirit and Scriptures promise us that the spirit will give us the right things to say and the spirit loves this stuff he loves when the we, the spirit loves when there's racial reconciliation reconciliation of any kind and we get when we get into rooms and we're talking with people who disagree with us who don't have the same beliefs as us who are in different political streams or or whatever it may be and 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 we get into this conversation the spirit will, will remind us to talk to each other with with love and with respect. And in scriptures, in the, in the book of Acts, in Pentecost, it says that God will give us every gift that is needed for us to understand one another and to hear one another and to love one another. The Spirit is calling us as, as a church to be the leaders in this re reconciliation. 
So the rest of the world, imagine that. The rest of the world can look at the church, imagine that, and see that, and we we can say as a church and have confidence and say that this is how reconciliation works. This is how healing works. This is how it's done. This is how, how, how we brand people together. Imagine that. If the world out there sees us Christians and sees, look, what the, you see those believers over there? Man, they're, they're up to something. We need to, go, we need to go talk to them, see how they're bringing people together. And lastly, as I conclude, and I'm done, I promise. Let's take the time to start at the starting line. If we don't know where to start, start here. Start to just to listen and to pray to God. Sometimes we think prayer is just talking so much. No, a lot of prayer is just listening. Listening to what the Lord is telling you in your heart right now about the issues that are going on. Ask the Lord to help me be aware of my own shortcomings. Help me be aware that I am part of a whole body. And help me, Lord, to help me look at the body of Christ holistically. And not just one part. And just because it's not affecting me doesn't mean that it's not part of me. Because I think about it like this. I think about it like traffic. Oh, we know how bad traffic is out here in California. We complain about it. We know it's there, but we never want to say, oh, wait, I'm part of traffic too because I'm sitting in this car stuck in traffic with everybody else. So God is calling us to great work, to continue to listen, to continue to pray and allow the Spirit to help us build this glorious dance that we're invited to for love, for healing and reconciliation and peace we got so much work to do, church. we got so much reflection to do. And we got so much learning to do. So let's pray. God, I just thank you for the moments that we have together. And God, if I can be candid, this was not an easy message to preach. But God, thank you for allowing me to have this platform to preach about what you have put in my heart. And I pray the church does not just listen to this and listen to another sermon, God, and just listen to another uh, um, a sermon about racism and injustice, God. God, I pray that you break the hearts of your people for, for all the injustice and the racism that is specifically happening to our black brothers and sisters, that we, that you break our hearts, God. That you help us understand, God. Give us the wisdom and uh, uh, wisdom, insight and understanding, God. And God, reveal to us our own shortcomings and how it's affecting us and how it's affecting me, God. God, I pray for the church. I I pray, God, that we don't pump our brakes on this issue, that we just don't move on. I pray, God, that we answer the call, that this is our moment as a church to prove to the world that we can actually bring people together. I pray for wisdom and understanding and insight. And I pray for our leadership of our country, of the United States of America. I pray for our leadership. I pray for our president. I pray for the representatives um, of every state that are trying to do their best and make change in this country. I pray that you give them wisdom, that you give them insight. I pray for, I pray God for, for, for your divine wisdom just to come upon them. And I just thank you for your body of, body of people, God. I pray that you continue to reveal to us as a body of Christ of what we can do to progress and move the needle forward for a better place, God. Thank you, God. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If this is your first time here, we are so glad to have you with us today. There are a number of ways for you to get connected with Symposia Church. First off, there will be a Zoom call right after today's service where you can meet with the pastor and also other members of the church. Please stay close to our Facebook and Instagram pages for that link. Also, you can fill out a digital connect card on our website at www.symposia.church forward slash connect. After we receive your information, one of our team members will reach out to you and will also send you a Starbucks gift card. Thank you, thank you, thank you again for joining us today.